Hi, everyone. Uh, we would like to welcome you all to this talk of the IEEE GRSS APS student chapter at the University of Southern California. Today, we are pleased and honored to have this talk presented by Professor Zoya Popovic entitled Microwave Internal Body Thermometry. Professor Zoya Popovic is a, is a distinguished professor and the Lockheed uh, Martin Endowed Chair of Electrical Engineering at the University of Colorado. She obtained her Diploma Ingenieur degree at the University of Belgrade, Serbia, and her PhD at Caltech. She has graduated over 55 PhD students and currently advises 15 graduate students in various areas of high frequency electronics and microwave engineering. She is a fellow of the IEEE and the recipient of two IEEE MTT microwave prizes for best journal papers. The White House NSF Presid Presidential Faculty Fellow Award, the URSI Isaac Koga Gold Medal, and the ASEEHP Terman Medal, and the German Humboldt Research Award. She was named IEEE MTT Distinguished Educator in 2013 and a Distinguished Research Lecturer of the University of Colorado in 2016. She was elected as member of the National Academy of Engineering in 2022. She has a husband physicist and three daughters who can all solder. Professor Popovic, we would like to welcome you again and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michelle. And I'm sorry I didn't update my PhD numbers. I graduated close to 70, but I forgot to update that. So, and they're all fantastic. And so at the beginning of this talk, I'd like to first thank my PhD students, Rob Streeter, June Lee, Caitlin Hall, Sofia Mbokani, and uh, postdoc, Dr. Gabriel Santa Maria Botello, and former PhD students, Rob Sheeler and Parisa Mumen Radaki. Will Haynes, who have contributed to some of the work that I'll be showing today. And this work has been funded most recently by NSF, the State of Colorado Aid Program, and Lumen Astra Incorporated, which is a, a, a company in Boulder, Colorado. So with that, I thought that maybe it would be interesting to tell you a little bit about the University of Colorado, since it's quite far away from USC. And you can see here, USC is somewhere here, and we are you know, in the middle of the country. And this is an interesting Blue, Bloomberg Brain Index from 2019, where blue is good. That means that a lot of people are moving, a lot of people with higher degrees are moving into the area and orange is bad. That means a lot of people are moving out of the area. And so you can see that Boulder was number one ahead of San Jose, which not many people actually know. If you look at the tier one research universities, where public ones are shown in blue and red are shown in red, uh, are the private universities. We are a very isolated spot in the middle of the United of the continent, and you can see your universities in red on the left hand side, like here. And uh, we are just in a vacuum. The good thing about this is that we get a lot of first generation students that come from the rural areas and mountain areas from. Uh, this region of the country. And so I've had the in incredible pleasure to work with very motivated students who really did not have an opportunity to go anywhere further, too much further away from home. Uh, this is what the university looks like. Uh, we have 32, about 32,000 students right now and five Nobel Prizes. Um, this number of 500 million is actually increased. It's over 700 million right now. And we've been the largest NASA funding funded um, public university for the last 25 years. Um, the, the thing I like about Boulder is that there are several national institutes. Um, NIST, which is the National Institute for Science and Technology, NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Lab, and then a bunch of weather labs, NOAA and CAR series, as well as the US Geological Survey. And this makes it a very vibrant city and we collaborate with a lot of these institutes as well. They have extremely smart people that are co-advisors to our graduate students. And you can see a picture of NREL with the experimental wind turbines on the bottom. And it's, it's a, a longer bike. NIST is a five minute bike ride from campus. NREL, uh, if you're a dedicated biker, maybe half hour. So as far as the group, uh, so I'm in electrical computer and energy engineering in the College of Engineering. And the RFEM group 
has a few members. So the, the top are kind of pure RF people. That's myself, Professor Dan Filipovic, who is an antenna expert, and Professor Taylor Barton, who is also a power amplifier expert. And then we've hired a new faculty member, but because the offer hasn't been officially accepted yet, I've left it blank, but we will have another person and we're very excited about that. And Professor Albin Gajewski does a lot of work in remote sensing for um, global weather predictions. And Melinda Pickett May uh, focuses on assistive technology and also on numerical methods for EM. Finite difference time domain is her expertise. We have about 15 researchers with PhDs. That means postdocs or research faculty, although only one research professor right now. Over 50 PhD students and some best paper awards. Um, three of us are fellows, two of us are endowed chairs, and one is a distinguished professor. And so you can see on the right-hand side, some examples of hardware from our group. And we work very well together. We all have joint collaborative projects and our students are often co-advised by two, a combination of the two of us. So I'd like to thank all of my students. These are pictures of different generations. So many of these have already have PhDs. And we go on field trips to big antennas, you know, and, and good receivers. And so these are radio astronomy receivers. This one is the VLA. And I have a little arrow pointing to John here because I gave his students a talk recently and I forgot to delete the arrow. So I apologize for that. He's a professor at Notre Dame. And so that's in Socorro, New Mexico. This is in uh, Puerto Rico when Arecibo was still functioning. And I'm not in the picture because I was the only one allowed to go into the feed. It was a windy day and it was, you, you couldn't be scared of heights because you had to walk on this catwalk, but it was fantastic. And this is on top of Mauna Kea and in front of our building. And my current group is shown here. This, this isn't everybody. We, just not everybody was in the lab when we took this picture, but they're a great group of students and you can see some of the equipment in the lab and some of the benches that we use on an everyday basis. And our most recent trip to Mauna Kea, um, radio observatories on Mauna Kea, so these are sub-millimeter wave, the James Clark Maxwell. So my group currently has 18 PhD students and a lot of them work on gallium nitride high efficiency transmitters for communications and radar for advanced transmitters uh, focused on high efficiency bandwidth and linearity. Um, we also have projects in medical applications on, on my, of microwaves, currently microwave thermometry, which I will talk about today. But we've also worked on very high field MRI and on, on uh, probes and amplifiers for ablation and cauterization. Um, and that was work with Medtronic. The MRI, high field MRI work was 10.5 and 19 Tesla, and that was work with um, the Harvard Medical School. So other projects that we're working on are wireless power transfer, and we've worked on this for a very long time, both in harvesting and very high power in the low frequency range for car powering. Um, we also have really interesting high power projects in microwave pyrolysis. For example, we're making a microwave trash can that converts um, mixed waste into usable fuel, surprisingly efficiently from an energy perspective. And then uh, we have a few projects in heterogeneous integration for microwave and millimeter wave front ends, as well as multi-beam and broadband antenna arrays. And then more recently, actually it's been already probably about 10 years in some uh, quantum devices, but really just the microwave part, I'm not the quantum person. Uh, for example, we've developed the DC Josephson Junction voltage standard, the 10 volt standard. And right now we've just um, uh, finished a paper on a one gigahertz, very pure sine wave using cryogenic you know, quantum devices. And we have uh, two projects, one with Lockheed Martin, one with DARPA on Rydberg Atom quantum um, microwave field detectors. So very sensitive detectors of RF fields. So this gives you a little bit of an idea and from here, I'm just going to dive into the topic that we chose and tell you what the motivation is. So basically the motivation is that there is currently no way uh, to non-invasively measure and passively measure internal body temperature. Um, someone is waiting, I will admit them there. So, um, 
there are many reasons why you might want to measure internal body temperature. Basically, it's different than the external temperature for a lot of cases. So for example, if you measure muscle temperature during exercise, um, it will be different than the skin temperature because the skin temperature cools with sweating, for example. Um, and, and it can be quite different. And actually this can lead to death uh, occasionally because the heart is a big muscle. And uh, I've talked to a bunch of soldiers who were, for example, in desert areas like Afghanistan, who told me that their, uh, you know, um, friends had dropped dead right next to them from overheating, and there was no way to measure the, 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 the internal temperature and external was fine. Uh, same thing happens actually to athletes very often or emergency workers like firemen. So, um, Let's see, I'm trying to get to the next slide. Oh, there we go. So body temperature is, uh, regulation is very complicated, actually, but bottom line is the temperature regulates ch chemical processes in the body. And so there are many, many events that are, can be explained by changes in temperature, but no methods to really uh, usefully monitor them. So some examples include diagnostic of patients in sleep disorders because of the way the circadian cycle works. And I think I have a slide that explains that a little bit better. And then obviously athletes, soldiers, even astronauts, and during various kinds of medical treatment. And I can give you a lot of examples of this if you're interested later, but I'll just um, maybe get into the technical portion. Some medical uses of microwave radiometry that we're currently addressing is brain temperature specifically when for uh, cardiac surgery during aortic repair, where the, temp the brain is cooled a lot uh, during heart surgery, and then it needs to heat up. And basically they don't know what the temperature of the brain is. And it can, it, many patients that have had heart surgery also experience brain damage to a smaller degree or larger degree. Arthritis and joint inflammation leads to increased body temperature internally. As, as well as diabetes and many, many others. And so this just shows some examples. One that's interesting to me that affects a lot of people is health and wellness. So if you think about a circadian cycle, which is the 24 hour cycle that most people are synced to, it's actually, I think, plus minus 21 degrees for everybody on the planet for healthy humans. So this cycle is accompanied by um, change between the temperature inside the body, the core body temperature, which usually refers to the temperature of the aorta coming out of the heart. So the difference between that and the out external temperature at the extremities. And it turns out this delta T is actually a periodic function of time during the circadian cycle. And the amplitude is two degrees for a healthy person, Celsius or Kelvin. And um, when, the mean, when it's in the minimum, so when your core is actually colder than the outside is when melatonin is regulated and that's when you go to sleep. And I know this personally because if my feet are, are too cold, I cannot go to sleep because actually your feet are supposed to be warmer than your core when this happens in a healthy person. So if this phase gets out, you know, if this gets out of phase, the sine wave, or if the amplitude varies too much, it leads to a bunch of disorders, including obvious things like sleeping disorders, but also some non-obvious things, some cancers and diabetes and so on. And there's a lot of documented medical work in this. So in terms of economy, the average adult in the US sleeps about six, close to seven hours a day. And it's 30% less than 30 years ago. So we're sleeping less. You know, I blame the internet. 20% of US adults average less than six hours a day, which is unhealthy according to all sleep experts. And 60 million US adults report frequent difficulty sleeping. An estimated indirect cost from insomnia because you lose productivity is over $60 billion per year. And so, um, it's a big impact, not just on people's lives, but also on the economy. And then, you know, in terms of feedback again on people's lives. So an important problem to address. 
And you can modify these. It turns out that if you measure and monitor the internal body temperature, you can, you know, turn on blue lights, make sure people eat on time, you know, and so on. And, and this can be regulated. So what are ways to measure temperature internally? Um, there are many oral, rectal, or ear thermometers, and they're invasive. They're not convenient for long-term monitoring. They're not wearable. And also, they don't measure the place you want to measure. They only come, they're an approximation. But doctors use them because they are the only you know, convenient thing they have. There are some ingestible pill radios that the US military has developed where you measure the temperature in the digestive tract. The reader, the pill is surprisingly large and it's not reusable and you don't really know where it is. And after drinking any liquid, the accuracy is reduced because it's in the digestive tract. And the readers have to be for some, I don't know who built this and you would think this could be done better, but the readers have to be very close to the body, like, you know, about a meter or less. There are some also surgically inserted uh, thermometer, thermometers, and obviously the, these are invasive and cause irritation. External thermometers also exist. Uh, MRI can be used for indirect temperature measurement with phenomenal resolution, but obviously it's very expensive, not portable, and arguably invasive because you get relatively high SAR for high resolution, specific absorption, right? But it's mostly it's very expensive and very big, so it's not useful for monitoring continuously. And then zero heat flux is an interesting method where you have two thermometers, an insulator, and a heater. And so you heat to keep two temperatures identical. And this is, um, doesn't work too much deeper than the top layers of the skin. And it's usually done in a, you know, like in a hospital environment. But it is a very interesting method. The only thing is that it doesn't really measure very deeply. So we're approaching the problem using microwave radiometry. Um, every object that's not at zero Kelvin, which is pretty much every object, um, emits across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, as you know, and that's called black body radiation. Even though the body doesn't have to be black, it, can, it has usually some kind of emissivity. And so, for example, this and, and the peak of this emission, so it emits from, I mean, basically DC to however high you want to go. But there's a peak to this curve, and the peak is a function of temperature. So, for example, the sun is at 6,000 degrees, and it emits its peak in the visible part of the spectrum, which is where our eyes are adapted as antennas and detectors. Uh, a human peaks at 310 Kelvin, and that is visible with infrared. And so that's the peak. So you would think, why don't we just use infrared cameras? Well, infrared is great, except uh, if you calculate the skin depth, and this is electromagnetic skin depth of infrared waves in the body, knowing the conductivity and so on, the electrical properties of the tissues, it turns out that you can only get penetration about, of, of, about a millimeter. And so it's not useful for um, buried tissues, you know, subsurface measurements. On the other hand, at lower microwave frequencies, the penetration is a few centimeters. And the lower you go, the bigger the penetration. But you are riding on the tail of the black body curve, which means that the thermal noise power we're receiving is low, you know in the minus 100 dBm range. So we have picked the so-called quiet radio bands that, are, that have been um, allocated to scientific applications, specifically radio astronomy. One of these bands is from 1.4 to 1.427, so uh, you know, 27 megahertz bandwidth around 1.4 gigahertz, and that's supposed to be a quiet band. It's actually not that quiet. There's a lot of interference, even though it's supposed to be quiet, but it's quieter than around two gigahertz where all the cell phones are working. So we're using that as a compromise. We'd like to use maybe something even a little lower because you can penetrate deeper, but, but then there's a lot of interference. And there's some history. You know, we're not the first people who have thought about doing this. Um, and people have done this at various frequencies, some less logical than others from the 1980s, basically. 
but there are no reported wearable or practical radiometers. This is mostly just at the research or kind of patent. They, there's some patents that are reasonable, but we didn't see anybody follow up. And there are a lot of challenging challenges that I will explain. There are some existing microradiometers for measuring core body temperature. There's some Japanese research that's been done specifically for um, a disease that, that is um, in infants where the, the brain is too warm. And if you can cool it in the first few hours of life, then um, a certain disability doesn't show up. So it's important. And so they've done some fairly large for in-hospital non-commercial systems that work well. They work at, in five different bands and so on, use big waveguide probes, and they're filled with water for impedance matching. So it's very different than what we want to do, which is basically a band-aid. There is a Russian company that seems to be doing some really good work. I, we had a little bit of a hard time finding out exactly what, but they sell a radiometer that is used for uh, breast cancer detection because the breast cancer tissue is warmer than the rest of the tissue, although only by a little bit. And so they have a clinical in-hospital radiometer for that specific use. But we'd like to do something wearable. Um, and we'd like to be able to work in all kinds of RF environments because we realize that if you are doing long-term monitoring, it's going to be very hard to avoid RF interference. So the black body radiation, if you look at 315 Kelvin with the uh, bandwidth of 27 megahertz, which is the quiet band that I just mentioned, you'll see that the thermal noise is at minus 99.3 dBm, which is about 120 femtowatts. So very, very low. So we need a lot of gain in the receiver and we need the receiver to have low noise. Uh, a standard radiometer, which is a receiver that receives thermal noise, is uh, has a sensitivity in terms of temperature that's delta T, that's the formula at the bottom, which is inversely proportional to the bandwidth and integration time. So how much you average because you're measuring noise, right? So the more you average, the bigger the signal you get. And so, and the square root of both of these. So you can either choose a very wide bandwidth and that's what some people do in terahertz radiometry actually for like concealed weapon detection. We've made some systems with NIST that had, you know, hundreds of gigahertz of bandwidth for this reason. Um, you can also actually use a smaller bandwidth, which we use so that we can get rid of interference. So we have filtering going on, but, but then extend the integration time of how long you're doing the measurement. And because any human, you know, temperature changes are very slow on an electronic scale. You know, you don't change your temperature in a second, right? It takes longer. And so we can have longer integration times. And I will show you later what this actually means. We've done experiments and calculations to see what the minimum integration time is that after which it doesn't make sense if you integrate any longer. So our device has a couple of parts. We have a probe. I'm not calling it an antenna because it's truly in the near field. So the design of this, if you want to call it an antenna, but the design of this near field antenna actually needs to take into account the tissues that are right under it. And then um, that's input into the sensitive receiver, which is a radiometer. And I can show you there are a few different kinds that you can make and the output of that is then digitized. And, and then because the total power that you're receiving is actually due to all the tissues under it, you have to do something clever and figure out how to retrieve the temperature of the specific region that you're measuring. And that's called an inverse, solving an inverse problem. And so that takes a little bit of, of care of thought and, and so on. The radiometer itself needs to be calibrated for, for gain fluctuations because we're measuring very low levels of noise. But also we have to calibrate the model or, or the person or the part of the body. And so that's something that Rob is working on right now. We're using fast TDR to do this calibration in situ whether it'll be part of the same sensor or not right now, we don't know, but, but anyway, you can do it once and then you know the tissue layers and then you can use that for this 
inverse problem solution. So as you can see, there are a lot of challenges here that need to be solved for, for a working device, let alone for something wearable and small and low power. A couple of PhD theses right there, I think. So how do we estimate this temperature? Well, the total power received from the stack corresponds to a radiometric temperature, KTB, where K is the Boltzmann constant, B is our 27 megahertz bandwidth. In this case, T will be the temperature. The probe measures a temperature that's a weighted sum of the temperatures of all the layers. This weighting, so T1 could be skin, T2 could be fat, T3 could be muscle, and so on, depending on what part of the body you're measuring. Here, the weighting factor is calculated electromagnetically. So we calculate it by dividing the power dissipate that would be dissipated in that layer in reception mode, and I will discuss this in a moment, divided by the total dissipated power in the whole volume. And obviously here we have to truncate the volume somewhere. We usually choose to ignore the last 1%. See? So I'm going to get back to why we're allowed to calculate the weighting factors in this way. So in any event, if you have three layers, then you would get a simple you know, linear formula. The top layer, you would be measuring the temperature also with an external thermocouple. And then you have to do some estimation and use some things you know about the thermal problem like boundary conditions and so on to, to um, extract the other temperatures after you've calculated the weighting functions. So the thing that we use here, and maybe, maybe we, we can use something else, but if you think about it, black body radiation happens because we have little currents that are inside our body and they're little antennas and they're radiating, right? But this is a statistical process. And so calculating these is actually not easy. People do do it. And if you look for publications, they're called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. But it's pretty difficult. On the other hand, we know that if we can assume linearity, which we can because everything is very low signal here, that then absorption and emission are actually re related by reciprocity. And so instead of calculating something as a black body, we can calculate it as a receiver, so as an absorber. And so we can transmit into the stack of tissues and find out what the absorption is, which is really Ohm's law, sigma e squared. Um, and then we can calculate the weighting functions from that, just from integrating. And it takes a little bit of thought to convince yourself that this is true in the near field, because it's well known that this is true in the far field. But because the system is linear, fields are fields, you know, it's, it's not that complicated in the end. So what are some of the issues when we're trying to design a probe or an antenna to receive this power proper, properly? Well, tissues vary dramatically in conductivity and permittivity. So in both the real and imaginary part of the dielectric constant, for example, skin has a relative permittivity of 40, which is very big, and a conductivity of 1.03 Siemens per meter. Oops, sorry, my units disappeared. This is in Siemens per meter. And fat has a much lower permittivity and is very low loss. Muscle is about the same as skin and so on. Like if you look at the brain, there is a skin and then there's some a little bit of fat and then bone. And then after bone, there's this sack of water that prevents our brain from hitting the walls too much. And that's called cerebrospinal fluid. And that's very lossy. So it's very difficult to penetrate a lot deeper. Because of this, that's one thing that we're struggling with a little bit right now. Although doctors tell us that the temperature of that cerebrospinal fluid is the same as the temperature of the brain. So we might be okay. Anyway, a good design of a probe will, you know, if you just take a patch antenna, it'll receive mostly from the skin. But what you really want is to receive, say, from the muscle. So you have to do a little bit of special design of this antenna. And that took us a little while to understand how to go about that. So this is an example of an antenna that uh, Parisa designed a while ago, but I just had a good picture of it. So it's a circular patch, you can see here. 
and it has a super straight, which so basically you can't see anything when the thing is finished because there's a super straight on top and it's Durate high dielectric constant 10. And if you look at what the fields look like underneath, in fact, this is not field, this is volume loss density because it's weighted by the conductivity. You can see that it receives, in this case, about 35% of the power from the muscle and 62 from the skin. And this was actually not that easy to get. It's hard to do that. It's skin is, the skin is really a problem, but we're not gonna take the skin off, you know, so we have to deal with it. I think the best we had is reverse, where 30% went from the skin and, and 60 from the muscle. So you can see that if you look at this plot, if you measure this little antenna in air, it's not very good, but if you measure it on top of either a phantom or, or a human body, it's well matched at the design frequency, and that was the goal. We've done some validation. This was done in HFSS. Usually we did use him for life, which is a commercial finite difference time domain code done by a, a company that was that's in Zurich in Switzerland. And you know, we get good validation and we look at boundary conditions on these stacks. And anyway, this is all good. But you know, students don't believe you unless you make a measurement. And so we did an experimental validation that was really pretty fun. So we took a power amplifier commercial at 1.4 gigahertz and made a phantom of the layers of skin, fat, and muscle. And then we put in a sensitive liquid crystal sheet, like so. The stuff you buy for like fish tanks, you know, the thing that change, like mood rings, you know, changes color depending on temperature. And then we turned on the amplifier. And what you see, this is the simulation. And this is what you actually measure. And so finally, the students believed, although if you think about it, this isn't really quantitative, right? It just shows you the shape. But the good news is, is that it really was heating up the, you know, the layers it was supposed to heat up. So we've designed all kinds of different probes, depending on what kind of circuit we were putting in the back. So some are folded dipoles. We've also done multi-frequency designs to get different sensing depths, different penetration, like this um, kind of folded dipole spiral looking thing. Um, and so there's, a, there's no unique solution. You know, there's many things you can do here. What about the radiometers that are connected to the, to the circuit? And if you would like someone to give you a specific lecture on radiometers and noise, you should ask my postdoc, Gabriel, Dr. Gabriel Santamaria, and he'd be happy to give you a more detailed talk on this, but I will just summarize here. So there's something called a total power radiometer, which is very simple, but it's susceptible to drift and fluctuations, and it's hard to calibrate these fluctuations while it's operating. So it's simple. We don't use this kind, but I can tell you that other people have tried to do this work, have tried to use this kind unsuccessfully. Then there's a well-known thing called the Dickey radiometer, which uses a switch at the front, and so it switches between a known source hot or cold or both, and the receiving antenna or probe. And the negative part of this is that you have a limited duty cycle during which you're, list, you're actually doing your measurement. And the other negative side is that the switch tends to be lossy. And so that affects your noise figure. Um, but otherwise, this is a great and, you know, great architecture and we've used it. And it's, it's well known. People have done a lot of different radiometers with the decay architecture. A third one that might not be as well known, I mean, radiometer people know it, but um, is a correlation radiometer. This eliminates the switch and you have like a balanced amplifier configuration. So you have two couplers and then two LNAs. And one of the inputs is always receiving and the other one is from whatever you're measuring, and the other one is receiving all the time from a noise source, so from the reference, from the standard. And so you can continuously calibrate actually this way. This also has a differential output signal. Um, the, it turns out that the phase balance is very important. Um, and it does eliminate the switch, but the couplers have some loss. Turns out switch is 
often have more loss, especially if it's not a single pole double throw. And then um, you need duplicated hardware, which, you know, if you make it on a chip, it's not that big of a deal, but if you don't, then it might be. And this has a better sensitivity by a factor of square root of two. Uh, so 50% better uh, as compared to the decay architecture. So it's maybe worth trying. So we made a Dickey radiometer um, that's fairly easy to calibrate with a hot and a cold noise source. And this is what it looks like. It's roughly credit card size and it's all made from commercial off the shelf parts. So we can integrate a lot of this on a chip, but we wanted to have a, a way to quickly replace different important parts of this. The filters, we need to have some filtering at the output and these are, turns out these are the hardest to find, but there's some good sources in Europe of these filters and they're not that expensive actually. So um, anyway, this is one of the measurements that we get. You get a DC output voltage and then you can do analog to digital conversion. And I'll show you more interesting measurements. This was really just to check that it was working. So if you look at the spectrum, um, you know, you can very easily see the 60 Hertz power line frequencies. So there's clearly some, and this is after about three seconds of integration time, and there's clearly some interference, even in this kind of, this was in a shielded environment, even in a shielded environment, you have to be really careful about signals coming in. Um, on the upper side, you see what thermocouples are measuring versus what our radiometer is measuring. And so they track each other. The integration time is an important thing to investigate. And so, sorry, we looked at an estimated temperature and the temperature measured by a thermocouple. And then we looked at the air, which is in gray, and the air is displayed on the right-hand axis. And so you can see this temperature, basically we heated the water bath and put the radiometer, you know, with the probe on top of the water bath. And then we let the water cool down and we measured this is time in minutes, you know, so clearly it took some time for this big bath of water to cool down, but we wanted to do it slowly, integrate a lot just so we can have more data. And what we found from this measurement is that the error is very small between the thermocouple, which we use as a ground truth, and our radiometer. Um, if the integration time is basically longer than one second. So it turns out that about two seconds, three seconds is plenty long to do this kind of a measurement, which is great for human temp. You know, we don't change faster than that for sure. And actually any thermal conduction also is much slower than that, which we've confirmed with experiments because it takes a long time for conduction. So basically when you use a radiometer, you're detecting the temperature at the speed of light through tissue. So extremely fast, basically instantaneous. So then we used a correlation radiometer. We built that one as well. And we use it to estimate temperature just, just to see what kind of error we can get. And we're getting an, a very small error in the measurement. And so we're happy it's about 0.2 degrees Kelvin. It turns out for many of the medical applications, they would like, you know, between 0.1 and 0.5, in some cases, even one. And most of, most of the research or medical people tell us that they need relative, not absolute. So that's good. Absolute is a little harder. You'd have to have an independent ground truth to compare to. It's doable. It's just harder. So I want to show you some limited measurements we've done on phantoms. What I've showed you now is just really a bag of water because that's easy to do. And it's similar to a lot of human tissues, but we've tried to do some a little more complicated measurements. So uh, the, I wanna show you as a beginning point, this homogeneous water phantom, just so you can see what happens and so you can see what, it, what interference does. So when we measure in a low RFI environment, and this is with the Dickey radiometer and very similar things happen with the other one, we see um, that we can get a fairly low error. So it's, it has a little bit of a positive bias, but it's basically within about 0.3 degrees. And the radiometer tracks the thermocouple quite nicely. That's low RFI. Then 
when we measured in an RFI environment, and I think it's on the next slide, there's a lot of noise. And so we had to work hard on shielding the radiometer. And you can see this is a shielded version of a Dickey radiometer. And in this case, we were able to reduce actually the error and do some tracking. The scales are, are different here. This is only a, a one degree scale on the vertical axis and the error is now below 0.1 degree or something like that. So it can be done, but you have to really work at it. And maybe even though this is not, it's maybe about 10 centimeters in size, the shielded version, it's bigger than we'd like it to be. We think that by miniaturizing further on chips, which is ongoing work, we can uh, help this because it simply won't work as like a very good antenna for the RFI. But this is a problem definitely that needs to be solved. So if you measure a spectrum somewhere, this was in our lab, you see that there's a lot of garbage. And you can see the radiometer picks that up. So, so the dashed line on this plot is a, is a thermocouple measuring a muscle layer of a phantom. And that was saline, but that on top of that was um, a duroid. And then we used smoked salmon for the skin. And the radiometer is picking up all this noise. And so the experiment looks like this. We have these layers here with the muscle phantom. And we took another probe um, and measured the outside interference. And then we used an algorithm to subtract that interference. And we were able to get a lot closer with this red line. So, and this was a very, very simple RF interference cancellation method, digital. And so people have done a lot more sophisticated. So, you know, we think this can be done, but, but I don't think we can avoid doing it. So then we did the measurement on a two-layer tissue phantom that now has the skin and the muscle. And you can see again that the uh, you know, radiometer tracks the thermocouple very nicely. And then if you look at the temperature of the skin, it actually takes a long time for it to track the temperature of the muscle that we controlled by heating and cooling the water. And so this was uh, interesting to, to see this because we thought that this would be happening and then it in fact did happen. And then we did a three layer buried tissue measurement and got roughly the same kinds of result. And this was done with that, um, with the probe. And then because of the three layers, we had each time we have to recalculate these weighting functions, but that's just a detail actually. So after that, we thought, well, let's try an in vivo measurement. And so we put a radiometer on the skin of my student, Will. Okay. And Will was a master student, so he had to be the guinea pig. And so then we would put hot and cold water in the mouth. And Will complained of a of his teeth hurting, you know, because he kept putting hot and cold water in his mouth. And then we had to look up the average tissue thicknesses of the skin fat and muscle in the cheek so that we could recalculate the weighting factors for the temperature estimation. And then we put a thermocouple inside the mouth. So, and the, a wearable radiometer on top. And the wearable radiometer was just a radiometer without calibration that was made by a capstone undergrad group. Let me see if I have a picture. Yeah, there it is. So it's wearable and it's battery operated, which actually helped with the noise. And here's Will putting this against his cheek and a little wire sticking out of his mouth where he's met, you know, the thermocouple is coming. And actually this device was communicating directly through a USB port with the transceiver and the computer. And we had a little, you know, program that was showing what the temperature was. And this wasn't even calibrated, but it showed really good tracking of the temperature given Will's uh, limited patients when we were doing these experiments. So what are the next steps? Well, um, my stu first few students really wanted to practice writing a patent. I I'm not that big on patents. Actually, when you're at a university, I feel like you should tell everybody what you do, and especially at a public school. But you know, students are a priority. They wanted to learn, so they wrote a patent up. And it turned out it got granted. And then 
a local entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, who's also an MIT electrical engineering graduate a long time ago, he decided that he really liked, he picked out of 200 patents at my university, he picked ours and made the company. And then he got some funding for my lab and he wants us to develop a prototype. And so we now have a, so he licensed this patent for the company. And now we have a prototype of a new kind of radiometer that's actually a combination of a correlation and a Dickey radiometer with a probe that's designed for the brain. And we're going to use this on sleep studies in Professor Ken Wright's group in our neurophysiology department. He's a world expert in sleep studies and he has a human study approved. Um, and because this is external passive um, and ha conform, you know, has basically the same for fa form factor as many other sensors, um, uh, he's had a pretty easy time getting it approved for this study. The other thing we want to do is do model calibration, and I'll discuss that just in a few minutes so you can appreciate the difficulty of this problem. And uh, we're also working with heart surgeons who would like a smaller prototype than this, about half the size, to measure the brain during aortic repair. So what is this thing, model calibration? It means to measure, quantify the thickness, conductivity, and permittivity of the tissue layers right under the probe that you're using to measure something in, that's buried, some buried tissue. So tissue thickness is varied from person to person and also location to location. And we need to know this. This is, you know, knowing what they are will give us much better temperature sensitivity and resolution. And so that's the motivation. It turns out that the probe will work for anything, but in order to estimate things properly, um, and especially if you want absolute temperature, then we need to know this. And so, for example, if you look at the tissues, skin, fat, muscle, skull, and the cerebrospinal fluid, nominal thicknesses in millimeters are like 2, 2.3, 2.2, but there's a lot of variation involved. You know, the skin can vary by a millimeter in, in, in thickness, the fat also, you know, so pretty much everything has a lot of variation and this will affect um, how we calculate. So if you look at the field pattern, actually this is the uh, joule losses, so it's sigma e squared. If you look at the nominal versus the varied case for a probe that's placed at the bottom this time, you can see that the pattern is quite different. So the weighting function changes a lot. So if, you, if we use the weighting function we've calculated for this case, it will not necessarily work very well for somebody else. So we need to do these measurements of tissues. And how are we doing that? We're using time domain reflectometry. And I think alternatively, you can also use a broadband network analysis, but we have some, we're working with a small company, a friend of ours actually, that has a, a very, a set of chips that do extremely fast pulsers and samplers. So we're doing it in time domain, although in principle through a Fourier transform, it's related to frequency domain. And so we transmit the pulse. Of course, now we need a different probe because it needs to be broadband. And so we've developed some broadband probes for this. And then we listen to the echoes and based on these echoes, we can find out the properties of the tissue. It's not as easy as it looks on, on paper, but it's a reasonable thing to try at least. And so as a part of his thesis, Rob Strader, my student is, is right now working on this. We're also working on miniaturization and another student has made a gallium arsenide chip that's about three by two and a half millimeters in size that includes a correlation radiometer. Um, and, and we've also made things that are roughly credit card size. This one's a little bigger, but we've shrunk it since there's a lot of empty space here. That's a hybrid radiometer that's a combination of correlation and Vicky. And the first one we started had all these separate parts and it was horrible looking, but it worked. So with this, I'd like to thank you and ask if anybody has any questions and maybe I will sh stop share. Do you want me to stop sharing the screen or what would you like me to do? I um, think maybe if you can keep sharing it if people ask questions because then you could switch to the okay. slide if, if there's something relevant 
Um, Sounds good. Sure. So I so, can get started actually because I had a couple questions. This was. Sir, uh, is is oh. this length about okay? I didn't want to go too much further. I think this it's better to ask questions, right? This is awesome. And yeah, I would be happy. I'll send you some of our papers if anybody's interested that have a little more detail, you know, but but go for it. Who is asking me first? Please do. So this was a really awesome talk. Um, and I think it was just right in terms of the, you know, the, the level of detail um, and, and sort of just to sort of pique our interests and then we can look at your papers to get more details. But so I had a, a few sort of uh, high, some high level questions and, and some uh, questions regarding so the um, understanding of, of what's going on. So I guess going from in chronological order backwards, reverse chronological order. So your TDR, um, what is the sort of center frequency and bandwidth for the pulses that you're sending for that? Is it similar range? Is it like around one gigahertz or are you doing a different frequency range? Um, so these are very, very fast pulses, right? So they look mm -hmm. like a comb. So they so the the these are fast repeated pulses with some duty cycle that actually is variable. Okay. And so and so what you get is a comb in frequencies that goes out to 100 gigahertz with a sync envelope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With a sine okay. x over x envelope, and uh, I'd be happy to send you details. We actually work with a guy from Berkeley who's he's not the University of, uh, of California. He's actually physically lives in Berkeley. <laughs> I see. But I think he also works with the medical people there. And he has a company called Furaxa. I've been collaborating with him for a long time. And actually, uh, he used our, our some of our GAN processes and made these very fast uh, pulsing circuits. Um, he has, you know, pic picosecond pulse times. I see. I see. And so is it's the idea... It's really cool. If, you, if you're interested, send me an email to remind me and I can send you the link to his company. It's kind of a cowboy link, you know, it's not very fancy, but it has the technical stuff is good. For sure. Yeah. And so is the is the idea that like, if you were going to make a product that you would actually embed a TDR yeah. in that so that you could characterize the different depths of the layers and then like on the fly train your model and be able to do the inversion. Right, um, and I, okay. I hate to use the word machine learning. <laughs> no, but it would be some kind of training method. I think for a lot of cases, you could do it just once and it wouldn't need to be a part of the same device because it would increase the cost, you know? A mm -hmm. lot of people, so, you you know, for anything in a hospital, they don't care. This would be a marginal increase in cost. They use, they use such expensive stuff, it's mind boggling. But if you were to do it for wellness, you know, or for monitoring people that are doing exercise, then it needs to be cheap. And then you would just, a one time, you would do a one time calibration and enter the weighting functions and that mm -hmm. would be it. So yeah. it, instead of, to find the weights, instead of doing TDR, would it be possible to design different probes that have different, basically, sensitivity to different layers? And so you're getting different yes. temperatures and then you build like an, you inverse, you have an inverse problem that way? Yes, you could do that. You would need radiometers at different frequencies. And so yeah. if I'm thinking, if I understand your question, and so we've done that with two frequencies, but you need more than two. And then it becomes again, replicating hardware. So my I hunch see. is that this would be better, the TDR, you know, but I don't know. You know, you know, basically I've only been working on this for a couple of years with starting from zero knowledge. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Cause we, and we got some funding from DARPA, actually someone, did that go i think national it's a funny funny how these things happen you know national semiconductor which is now texas instruments i had a project with them in envelope tracking pas for base stations so totally different and they came and said you know we need help from some microwave person because we have this darpa project with berkeley and they have not finished their part can you help us just so we have some result for this report and so that's how i learned about this problem i had no idea <laughs> And we helped them out because it turned out that you did, did need to know some RF and electromagnetics and we helped them. And then I wrote a proposal to the NSF and got it funded because my student was interested. And then after that student, nobody else was interested for a while. So I didn't bother. And now I have these five students working on it. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> <Cool>. they're, <laughs> but they're all very new, you know, so we have to start over. So. Makes sense. 
Um, so my, my only other question, and I'm going to let other people ask questions, was... No, no, it's fine. I have time one, if you guys do. Yeah. <laughs> one of your previous slides, yes. um, you showed, it looked like you had two antennas on the scan and you had a phase shift on one. Um, I, can you, I guess, explain sort of what, like how you were, not this one, maybe the one before? Uh, I think it was this one. Could, could you go one or two slides back? Because that's um, this one here. So you, you um, have like, it looks like you have two and two probes and you have a phase shift with a control circuit. I didn't quite get that because this is a Dicky radiometer. How, do, how, how does that work? Yeah, this is probably a wrong picture, but basically what this was meant to describe was, the, was this, sorry. I see, okay. Sorry, that was supposed to be a, a time delay and it's done digitally, you know? And so what you do is you just uh, sample and you cancel the interference by adding 180 degrees, right? I see, I see. And it was just a bad out. drawing. I will take out that drawing. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so the, the other probe is actually away from the muscle, so you can. Uh, yes, the other probe the can RFI. look out. Yeah, you look outside because mm -hmm. actually the probe that you have looking down doesn't receive that much. But the problem is that you're receiving minus 99 dBm, right? So. Yeah. Anything you receive is bad. And so just putting the probe outside is fine. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Very, very exciting talk. Very cool stuff. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Maybe some of your, after you give your talk, maybe we can combine. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, we, uh, so I, I was actually going to ask you, because uh, we, uh, half of my group works on analog IC design. So we do chips. So we do, are very interested in miniaturization of stuff and sensors and that sort of thing. The other half of my group, we actually do uh, computational EM. So we do a lot of modeling, a lot of design of uh, solvers and stuff. And so I was going to ask you if we have a preference, one or the other, I can maybe give a sort of description of both and maybe zoom in on a couple projects on in each front. You know, um, I'll I let you pick, but if you can give an overview so people can ask you if they're interested, we're interested in both. We okay. do, this talk was kind of more EM if you want, or more physics, but a lot of our work is in gallium nitride from 250 nanometer nodes to 25 nanometer nodes, you know, so W awesome. band. And, and so next time I can give you a talk on that if, you, if, yeah, people, like that if people like amplifiers, <laughs> but it's yeah, mostly amplifiers. That would be great. Most of our, actually, most of our background experience is in CMOS. So uh, GAN is, you know, would be great to learn more about essentially. So we, we typically- We are work clueless in CMOS. in CMOS, so you should tell us. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So you pick, it doesn't matter. We'll learn something okay. no matter what you pick. Sounds good. Any well, questions from the uh, students? Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, such an interesting talk. Uh, I personally, half of my research is uh, basically temperature monitoring using microwave. We just use active stuff, but uh, using thing from a passive radiometer perspective was quite interesting. I was so fascinated with the term that you use for the near field probe as opposed to not referring to it as an antenna because because I, I, I personally have a, have a whole paper that just discussed that this is a probe, it's not antenna. Oh, so, can you give me a reference so I can blame it on you then because <laughs> I'm so tired of this. But you know, if you call it a probe, it's not good either because medical people think you're poking someone. Right, right. Um, so I right. don't know what is a better word. You can't say sensor either. I've tried that. If you come up with a better word, let me know. Sure. Um, the paper is actually under review in TAP uh, right now. But uh, the whole idea was uh, really trying to avoid antenna people to show far field pattern for microwave imaging system that works in near field. <laughs> so. I know. I know. It's really ridiculous. And right. also, you cannot design it like an antenna without Absolutely. the tissues, right? Yeah. It's wrong. Yeah. Like the whole yeah. design that we did was like filling or microwave imaging chamber with a matching fluid and then like designing the whole system together, uh, which was quite interesting. Um, I have I, a few maybe simple question. Uh, one thing um, that I think goes back to that weighting function. And by yes. the way, I'm just like going ahead asking question. But, but before that, 
if anybody has a question, please go ahead and raise your hand. Of he he's got a long list I can see in front of him, so you might want to jump ahead. <laughs> um. So if not, I'll just ask a few questions that I'm just to clarify myself. So for that weighting sure. function, you basically and uh, that multi-layer structure is also quite interesting because the way that we treat the subsurface is like a multi-layer structure. Uh, for, for a radar imaging, we basically have multi-layer structure with roughness, and then what we have like our own forward solver, like a small perturbation method or other things to just calculate the scattering. Now here you're saying like the, uh, the brightness temperature is a weighted function yeah. of, can you explain that a little bit more? Like, uh, Sure, let me see if I can find where that was. This one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so when you're, so this is used also if you've ever looked at radiometry of the atmosphere. When you look up at layers of the atmosphere, they reach from ground based radiometers. This is usually millimeter wave because they're looking at these species of oxygen and whatnot, gas species, right? So you look up into the atmosphere, what they'll say is the total brightness temperature I'm receiving will be due to the first layer, the second layer, the third layer of the atmosphere, and so on. And they model it as a linear sum, as a linear combination. Okay. And it seems to be a good way to do it. Um, it's certainly a good approximation, I would say, because the signals are so low, so there's no reason there should be any nonlinear effects. So you're just saying it's a superposition, you know? Okay. I don't and, know um, how, is that clear? Does that make sense? Like, um, so that sigma, the conduct, like that weighting function um, is a function of T also. That T is the thickness or is the temperature? I guess uh, that's, F. oh, that's the thickness. Oh no, D is the thickness. D is the thickness. Yes. Like, it does, it does depend on temperature as well in an indirect way, uh, in, in the sense that it depends, in the sense that sigma and epsilon can depend on temperature. I'm sure you're aware of like, aware of like the Debye model yeah. for water, for the water molecule, right? Or other like coal, coal or whatever people talk about. So that really is meant to describe that that model is a function of frequency, so that's dispersion but it's also a function of temperature. So, and so provided you know the temperature, in, so this is very general. Now you know that a human is at, you know, in a very, our temperature is a, in a very narrow range actually, right? Before you die either of being frozen or too hot. Mm -hmm. And so the permittivity and conductivity doesn't change to the best of my knowledge, doesn't change that much. But this is to be general. Yeah, good eye. That's a good question. And it is true what's written here. Okay, interesting. Um, and I, can you, mm, I'm also coming from a hardware perspective. Uh, can you explain um, like what was, the, what was the last choice of the radio? And okay, let me put it this way. So we, like a lot of our active devices were initially single frequency, but then we moved on various frequencies, like multi-frequency, quad band, this type of structure. Right. So I have two questions. Why, when is, is any of the uh, radiometer or multi-frequency or not? And the other uh, question is, why a ultra wide band or a wide band correlator, correlation radiometer is, is that a good option or is, is a wideband radiometer a good option here or not? So, you know, a wideband radiometer you would use for a short integration time. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, I think wideband would open you up to a lot of interference. You right, know? right. But so other than... I, I personally don't think it's a very good option personally, but, but it's based on on experience, you know, maybe maybe we're just not doing it the right way. In terms of your question about multi-frequency, I think that that's a good 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 approach. And in fact, we've done that at 1.4 and at 2. Point, I think 2.7 is another quiet band somewhere around that, and 700 megahertz, so 700 something. 
And we've actually designed probes that are dual frequency and then had a dual frequency radiometer. It's hard to make one that has competitive noise and then you need filtering, you know? So I would say it's a good idea, but in the end, it's a question of how good you can get the hardware, you know, how well you can get the hardware to work. Um, whether you make two separate radiometers at two frequencies or one dual frequency, it's, it's not clear to me what is better, probably two separate ones, especially if you integrate them on a chip. How small um, could you make the, uh, sorry, cousin, one said, uh, no, how no. small could you make the uh, probe itself? Um, is that, could you make it small enough to integrate that on a chip as well? Or is that, that needs to be no, bigger? Well, not at these temperatures, you know, mm -hmm. not at these frequencies, sorry. Um, yeah, because it's the, the, the wavelength is pretty big at one gigahertz. So you'd probably need it right. to be at least and centimeter in fact, scale. In fact, if you want, Spatial, no, no, we're not using doing imaging here, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted an increased spatial resolution, you can do some near field beamforming actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we've done a little bit of that, and then that, that of course makes, makes it even bigger. But you do gain. So I guess my answer is if you want any kind of spatial resolution, and here it's on the order of a centimeter, mm -hmm. then you do need a fairly large antenna probe. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Awesome. So I don't um, think it's reasonable to put it on the chip, but I don't know, we could try. Uh, that'd be a very big chip. <laughs> yeah. Usually our chips are millimeter size per side. So <laughs> I think that the size of our radiometer will be limited by the probe actually, because we've already integrated most of it, except for the filters on chips. And these are gallium arsenide. You know, I like three, five semiconductors. They have great noise. Some of them, lots of power, you know, high IP3. Yeah. So they're very, very good. Yeah. But yeah. not, apparently not as cheap as silicon. Although last time I tried to price a silicon millimeter wave run, it was very expensive. Yeah. Compared, it depends on what, compared what, to what, what, really good gas, you know. What process so, node were you looking at? Well, I can't remember, but anyway, I'm I'm not a. I'll let you guys do silicon. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, like it, it depends on the process node. So if you need to do something at like, for example, Michelle's chip was at 180 nanometer, and that was, um, it's about a thousand dollars per square millimeter. So it's not terribly expensive if you're using a bigger process node, um, but of, of area. Um, so it, it depends on what you're doing. If you need a lot of area, then it very quickly <laughs> scales. Scales up. Um, yeah. Yes, gallium arsenide is quite competitive, actually. Mm -hmm. 150 nanometer gas or lower, you can get really good devices. At wind semiconductor is probably you know, a few tens of dollars for a reticle. Tens oh, of wow. thousands. Okay. Thousands for a reticle, yeah. So, yeah, it's I, I just like three fives. <laughs> but that's, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that it depends on what you're doing. So like if, if you're doing sure. high performance or high power stuff, then three fives are, are the best, they're great. Um, on the other hand, like if you if you need to have a lot of integration or digital or stuff like that, yes. need, yep. then like a, a hybrid, CMOS or a hybrid between the two is, is, is like a, a good bet because you yeah, can that's put a lot of transistors. I've, I've, because I can't really, I think it's really hard to compete with industry in CMOS. And so I've made the conscious decision to actually not do CMOS and instead we do heterogeneous integration. So I have two programs, one is called SHIP and one is called MECA. And both of these have ways to integrate the best of, you know, whatever for the function. Uh, one is, has a fantastic thermal and RF ground and the other one is more layer based, you know, so you have a lot of interconnects. So they're quite that different, but that's yeah, also but an interesting problem, you know, so, yeah. That makes sense. Um, by the way, I just saw like um, I, on, earlier on LinkedIn that you were inducted into National Academy of Engineering. Um, so congratulations on that. That Thank is you. really awesome. <laughs> it's a huge. You know, I was really surprised because it's all a very secret process. So, <laughs> well, I didn't know and it turned out it wasn't my university, but some other people who nominated me. So that was nice, yeah. That's awesome. That's great. Thank you. Thank you.
It just means more committees, Constantin. <laughs> <laughs> more, more, more service to the community, right? <laughs> I, I've already, you know, I was just inducted like two weeks ago, and the official thing is until October. And they've already called me to three meetings. Imagine, just two weeks ago. <laughs> and, uh, oh, you'll be entertained by this. So the other person who is in my class is Elon Musk. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yes, my plan is to explain to him what the, the unit Tesla is. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you know, in Serbia, there is a bill, a hundred dinner bill has Tesla and it says the unit is Weber per square meter and it has a picture of an asynchronous motor. <laughs> wow. So, <laughs> That's cool. Wait, That's just yeah, for you your entertainment. You, you should explain it to him. He probably doesn't know. So. <laughs> yeah, I think I've probably we've exhausted everybody with questions, no? Anybody else? Did you have more Michelle? questions, Kazem? I kind of interrupted you, so I apologize about that. Oh, no, oh, Kazem? No, no worries. Thank you so much. Um, the, the last thing that I actually quite, uh, and I'm, I think I'm making everybody tired, and also it's late, uh, I think, in the East Coast. Uh, apologies for... That's okay. I'm actually on, on mountain time, <laughs> mentally. Oh, okay. Uh, this is my last question, and it's along the same You line, promise? But... Are, are you promising? <laughs> yes. It's, <laughs> it's like okay. Matt always says, like, Cousin, you just took five minutes, right? And then it goes like 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, Cousin, two minutes. Sure. Uh, that TDR probe, uh, like, it meant to just calculate the depths of the of the uh... no it's depth conductivity and permittivity and okay. that's what we would like but it's we'll see i'll let you know how in okay. principle you can do it in principle you know mm -hmm. but i don't know if we'll if we may need something else to really get all the information okay yeah, that was, that was it, <laughs> I promise. I mean, if you think about it, think about a broadband network analyzer measurement, right? Yeah, it's, it's like, let's say- the um, Same thing. For sure, yeah. Um, or, or any sort of wideband signal that you just send to just get a, a higher resolution, range, resol range, range resolution, like a GPR, let's say, that yeah. you burst a, a large bandwidth. Uh, because you said 100 gigahertz, I was like, why we need 100? Like, it's that's no, not No, you bandwidth. don't. It's, it's just that when you make, you know, when you make a narrow pulse like that, that's roughly Gaussian. I mean, it's not quite, you know, you get, and it's periodic, you're going to get a, kind of a sync spectrum mm -hmm. that goes very high, but the amplitude of the high tones is very low, you know, so most of it will be in that first slope. Sure, sure. So, so um, that TDR range is like within the, within the basically the, the frequency range of the 1.4 and like the, sa the same range, right? No, it doesn't have to be, right? It, you have a pulse repetition rate and just very broadband pulses. The pulses okay, are very broadband. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, it was really... I, I just have one question. Uh, it's more... Shella has been trying. Don't worry, I wouldn't have been trying. <laughs> Uh, it's one question about the power consumption, if it's meant like to be a portable radiometer. So what about the power consumption? Yeah, so the current one, which is based on these off-the-shelf components, is about half a watt. <laughs> but, but we're integrating it to be much lower. I don't think that that will be a limitation, actually. And we did have one that we operated off a battery, you know. Um, I but I can't give you a better answer except for what we have right now. I see. You know. yeah. uh, and yeah, if other people have questions, so please feel free to ask. Otherwise, like, um, I guess no more questions. Um, thank you so much, Professor Popovic, and congratulations again on your election. And you are looking forward to uh, having you in person. Um, okay. For future talks. <laughs> okay, very good. And I will look forward to. Professor Sider is giving a talk to my group. They will be ready with questions, I hope, like yours. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank great. you for the invitation. Thank you, Thank you for care. being interested and for the great questions. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Professor.